So this lecture is going to be on Orlando. Orlando is based on a novel from 1929 by Virginia Woolf. As some of you already know, my formal training is in comparative literature, and my favorite period is the Edwardians, the writers of the early 20th century. We understand the Edwardian world in response to the death of Queen Victoria in 1902 and roughly the end of the First World War. Those of you familiar with Downton Abbey would be very familiar with, with um, <clears throat> the Edwardian world itself. What's important is to understand the Edwardian temperament of Virginia Woolf and the ways in which her fiction and her life challenged her temperament. And we'll be able to talk about Orlando from 1929 as a modernist piece of literature. First of all, let's think about the roles that women had in the early 20th century. The Stevens sisters, Virginia and her older sister, Vanessa, um, were educated by their mom at home by and large. The kinds of educational privilege that we have wouldn't have shifted until significantly later, though the suffragette movement and all kinds of movements for women had most definitely started up within the, I'd say primarily the privileged classes in English society of the early 20th century. When we look at the Victorian world in the 1900s, we look at what we understand in response to social convention and very organized, rigid ways of, of understanding what you would think about as the heteronormative world or the norm core. But after Queen Victoria's death, her son Edward came to the throne and he was in some ways the wild child. And prior to the First World War, this short period in history revealed a high level of opulence, of financial stability, where the English from what I, the term the English uses middle class, that pretty much means upper class to us had rather free and incredible lives. This uh, most definitely included empire and colonialism, but it also included a development in youth culture and the arts where young men and women began thinking, drawing, painting, writing about how they might have seen a better world. This was usually done in literature through the expose of Edwardian social conventions and the rigidity seen in the Edwardian world. In many ways, this type of writing, which we do see not so much in Wolf's work, but, but in the works of her contemporaries, um, especially uh, you know, when we look at, at, at the work and the ways in which it surfaced, we see an expose of, of, of Edwardian social conventions and the limitations um, that, that existed during this period of time for most, peoples within, most people within society. Believe it or not, by the year 1901, 14% of women under the age of 45 years did not marry. <clears throat> The suitability of husbands was an exceptional, exceptional issue. So the institution of marriage, by the time Virginia and her sister Vanessa would come to age, would be in uh, an, an unwritten, immovable position within society. Um, what was changing in response to the family unit is that families were having fewer children. Women were volunteering, <clears throat> women became involved in politics, and women started to work. It was a slow movement forward <clears throat> in the Edwardian era. So the kinds of understandings of what we might see as modern society, factory work um, for wireless telegraph signal companies, women started to work in what was once a particularly male-driven workforce. So along with sport and play, Virginia Woolf was very aware of the necessary advancements 
for women, by women. She was a feminist. And her work, Orlando and Bodies, an exceptionally fluid and almost postmodern understanding of how we might think about gender. She was born into an affluent household. She was um, born in, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> she was uh, born um, in 1882. And she was encouraged by her father to start writing professionally. Virginia Woolf had uh, trauma in her childhood, uh, like lots in fact. And it's believed that she was sexually assaulted by one of her brothers. Um, her fiction allowed a release for her. She did marry Leonard Wolfe. They seemingly had a lovely friendship, but their marriage was perhaps cliche English, if I could say so. And the, they never had sex. I recently read Leonard Wolfe's biography and it appeared that this didn't ever seem to happen or when it did, it was highly infrequent, but they were very devoted to, to one another. Um, her works, which are understood as early 20th century work that inspired feminism, has been translated into over 50 languages. So think about the impact Wolf made when she, when she published her work. Um, <clears throat> so within this marriage, Virginia Woolf crashed rather frequently. And as Leonard Wolf's biography reveals, he took a lot of care of her. Um, her, her mental illness, her wellness issues stemmed from a deep-seated sexual fear and a resistance to masculine authority. This, of course, made sense as there was evidence of sexual abuse by both sisters, by their um, older half-brothers and their cousin. So think about the way the impact and the psychological impact this must have had. It formed for Virginia Woolf a, a kind of psychological dimension within her fiction that at times was a little out there or ethereal. And at other times, and this is what Orlando articulates, was just rather incredible. Virginia Woolf's life shifted when she met Vita Sackville West in 1922. Uh, West was married to Nigel Nick Nicholson and they, they had a very modern and very English marriage with same-sex lovers on the side. Um, they understood these as quote necessary indiscretions and there was no shame in, in the kind of marriage that they had. I think there's a documentary on their marriage if I'm not mistaken. Um, Sackville West published uh, a kind of sardonic novel called The Edwardians in 1930, if I'm not mistaken. And um, she, she wrote other works as well. Sackville West formed in many ways for Virginia, the, the, the creative conception of the character of Orlando, who remains, as we'll see in, some ways androgynous and in other ways a character who surpasses time and will wake up a couple of times within their lifetime as a different gender no spoilers because the film does a rather incredible job with this um she dedicated the novel to Vita Sackville West Vanessa Bell her sister was um, an incredible artist. And she ran what was understood as the Omega workshops during this period of time. So Virginia and Vanessa changed the world through their art, one through the visual arts and one through writing. They had a coterie of friends who would hang out at their places, mostly Vanessa's to be honest. Uh, and they referred to themselves, or we refer to them, as the Bloomsbury Group. They all lived within the larger, or the smaller Bloomsbury area of London. That's the area that runs between Charing Cross, 
Charing Cross, the, the no, Charing Cross, the British Museum, and Russell Square. This area was surrounded by these writers and thinkers. They all came from white affluence or privilege, but all of them had one thing in mind, and that was to change the world. They wanted to change Edwardian social convention and the problems within their world that held them back. I feel Orlando is the most incredible voice from a writer who came of age during this period. It's 1929 publication date is no mistake either that it really is a modern novel and it's by no ways Edwardian, even though the temperament and the time frame of growing up for the writer would have been. You'll notice <clears throat> when, when you screen that um, there is something amazing in the representation of Orlando to us. When Orlando is male, as, as it's an act, uh, an actress who plays her, Tilda Swinton plays her, um, or him, right? When the, when the character is supposed to be male, there is a very high level of androgyny that it still feels like there's a woman portraying this character, which I think is super important. And I think Potter did this in her, her, her vision and version of this novel so that we were outside of what gender was supposed to look like. There will be a shift in response to when Orlando becomes woman and, um, and without too many spoilers, the word androgyny will be used towards the end of the film. The hero is, is born a male nobleman in English during the reign of Elizabeth I. Um, something mysterious in response to sex and gender happens at 30, and he lives on for 300 years into modern times without really aging. Um, he will be, you'll see how he's the favorite of the queen, and then you'll watch the ways in which history and gender begin to intermesh. And um, through this intermeshing, we are allowed to and invited into a complete questioning of the limitations of reductive understandings of gender. Um, <clears throat> what will make this film special is it works. It's, uh, it's visually camp and magical at the same time. You're gonna have the representations of the different historical periods, but there's something artificial and campy with them. Remember when we think about camp, we think about the ways in which camp functions as a device that blows up gender, it explodes it, where it becomes almost unbelievable, so much so that there could be a kind of failure in a camp representation. This would be intended. Did Sally Potter's 1992 version of this novel into film, did it break from the novel? No. Wolf's tone and the tone of the Edwardians, the Edwardian cadence when you read, almost implies a satirical undermining of the way that the story is being told. And I think the film does a rather um, clever job with making sure that this tone is is medically repeated throughout the film version itself. <clears throat> so when we think about films that work or don't work, I would be very surprised if you didn't find this film was effective. Um, I think that this film will get us to step back from the debates we have about gender. And then I urge you to go back to the original novel and realize that for a hundred years, we've been debating about ways that we might think about gender and the limitations placed on gender. So in my edition of, of Orlando, in my edition of Orlando, and you'll notice this 
throughout, if you have a written version too, you'll find voiceovers with the, the, the film version that will reveal the authenticity. But I also have a preface <clears throat> from Virginia Woolf herself and let's have a look at it. So I'll read to you a little bit and edit out some stuff. And I'm then gonna try and sum up <clears throat> the way the writer might've thought about herself. <clears throat> I'll try and do my best for Virginia Woolf. Many friends have helped me in the writing of this book. Some are dead and so illustrious that I scarcely dare name them. And yet no one can read or write without being perpetually in debt of Defoe, Sir Thomas Brown, Stern, Sir Walter Scott, Lord Macaulay, Emily Bronte, De Quincey, and Walter, pa Walter Pater, to name the first that come to mind. Others are alive and though perhaps as illustrious in their own way, are less formidable for that very reason. She attempts to posit herself within the history of the greats of literature. And her key word that she uses in this preface is illustrious. The character themselves will be illustrious. Um, throughout the rest of the preface, which sadly doesn't take any form outside of that, begins thanking people over and over and over again, revealing what I think is the vulnerability of this writer herself and the way she felt so supported by her Bloomsbury community and friends and family. Um, there is very, very little about what the novel would be about. And I read you what I read you for the word illustrious. I, I, I wonder if Wolf realized how powerful this novel would be. You'll notice throughout the film, much like the novel, there will be a consistent reference to, 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 to sex, to gender, to patriarchal lineage. And I'll read to you a little bit from chapter one. <clears throat> I'll try again to perform it a little bit for you. He, for there could be no doubt of his sex, though the fashion of the time did something to disguise it. Just think of those first lines, right? That we're supposed to look at this character instantly understand him as he, but think about the tone, and you'll hear this at the beginning of the film too, that even though the representation of the time was somewhat not quite androgynous, but not what we'd understand as masculine, were to understand Orlando as masculine. And I'd like you to think about what Sally Potter does with this character. I'll continue reading to tempt you on a little more. Orlando's fathers had ridden in fields of asphodel and stony fields and fields watered by strange rivers. And they had struck many heads of many colors off many shoulders and brought them back to hang from the rafters. So too would Orlando, he vowed. But since he was 16 only and too young to ride with them to Africa or France, he would steal away from his mother and the peacocks in the garden and go to his attic room and there lunge and plunge and slice the air with his blade. So Orlando is presented to us as a character desiring to come into his masculine self, to become part of British colonialism, to go to other places as a <laughs> warmonger of sorts, and thus live out his days within the paradigms of the traditionally masculine. As the novel sets this up for us in chapter one, everything that follows will question the way that's set up. So the kind of sardonic or ironic tone that Wolf uses, you're going to see in the film as well. And think about the way that Orlando will battle or combat, maybe that's a better word. I mean, they pretty much mean the same thing, the one has less blood in its imagery. 
the way that 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 gender is understood. And I hope this gives you a little bit of <clears throat> background information and a bit of a foundation so that when you screen, think about something written in 1929 that's super progressive, and then 1992, a very progressive time, transforming this into a film. Thank you for listening.